Hello, I'm John Ball, the founder of Pat Inc. and a cognitive scientist who has spent more than 30 years understanding how brains work. Today, I'm pleased to welcome you to the start of our new series on talking machines, which will be split between this video format and a written format with additional detail. We will talk about how languages communicate and what the underlying model looks like. In short, this series addresses human language understanding. I will update you on what I've personally learned since 2012 when I stumbled across role and reference grammar linguistic model in a Princeton bookshop and how machines in the future will use this approach to understand us when we converse with them. There is some fundamental language theory that I believe should be taught in schools and so I'll run some introductory lessons to explain the basics of meaning-based language in conversation during this series. Last year, I used our NLU system to pass the benchmark test created by Facebook. Amazingly, we found errors in their training data. Just think about that. Our best machine learning systems can be broken by feeding them undetectable, incorrect data. This series also allows me to take you through how developers in the future will use NLU to create applications using real human languages. Human languages are built on a meaning layer and a common context to communicate. That system is also known as discourse pragmatics. <laughs> the, the pragmatics of tracking discourse. It's complicated. But by decoding the meaning of human language, a new type of machine will work with people regardless of the language they speak, thereby reducing the cost of machines while bringing people closer together than ever before. Let's get started. What is it that we need to do for machines to understand us? I propose to consider the question, can machines talk? The question is in honor of one of my heroes, Dr. Alan Turing, whose 1950s paper asked the similar question, can machines think? It's been nearly 70 years since he wrote that, and our progress has been poor at best to pass such a test. NLU is fundamental to a machine using conversation with human language. Once we have NLU, Turing's real challenge of the imitation game can begin playing verbal chess, incorrectly adding numbers, general lying, and perhaps even talking about politics. This channel is focused on what we need to do to implement the middleware for him, the language understanding layer needed to convert human language into meaning. Okay, let's get going. What we're gonna do is just introduce the overall concepts that we'll be covering in the series, and then later on, we'll worry about the, uh, the detail as we, as we go through. So here's, here's a quick introduction. In, instead of the concept of parsing, we've introduced the concept of meaning matcher because what we're doing is we're finding the elements that comprise the, the meaning of the sentence and then assembling them. Uh, so meaning matcher instead of parsing is just the term that we're using. Now, in terms of the science, there's this concept of formal linguistics where words are basically a string of letters and that's it. Uh, and then it's up to rules or other types of techniques like engrams or... Uh, um, neural networks, that, that type of thing that you then use to, um, based on experience from corpus linguistics or uh, uh, documents that people have annotated manually, that type of information then becomes statistics which you can use um, in the absence of meaning. But when you look at this diagram, what you can see um, is the formal linguistics path basically takes information and then produces a result. It's a black box. Uh, so if you're working with a neural network, you train it, and then you get new data, you push it in, and you see what pops out. Uh, and the, the challenge with that is if, if it produces an answer that's wrong, why is that answer wrong? Well, it's the sum of the whole system. Compare that with the functional linguistic model. So here we've got NLU. So th this is the original model of, uh, of NLP, natural language processing, composed of uh, NLU and NLG, so language understanding, language generation. It's a pretty simple concept. So um, for a, a native speaker of some language, you know that you hear the words, you then break those words down into phrases and sentences, uh, and somehow or other, your brain is able to then work out what was meant. When you want to say something, you know what it is you want to say, and then you convert that into words and phrases and then you say it. So um, while I'm speaking to you now, I can be pretty confident that I'm not choosing the individual words, I'm just choosing the concepts and pushing the concepts out, uh, in this case, in the form of English. 
so that that breakdown from words and phrases into meaning, uh, what you can see on the diagram is that's a definition in a dictionary. Uh, why do we call it a dictionary definition? Because uh, that's how human beings would learn words in the language that they don't currently know. And there's a code which uh, another one of my idols, um, George Miller, the, the psychologist uh, who produced Word at Princeton, um, we'll cover a lot of that detail um, in the future as well. When, when you look at that type of thing, um, he's produced a, uh, a dictionary definition based on how dictionary definitions are written um, and, uh, and using associations in order to then use it for, um, for WordNet. And we can automate then the selection of the correct dictionary definitions. Now, one of the problems that we then came across was dictionaries are based on parts of speech. Parts of speech are um, highly ambiguous. You get multiple parts of speech for one definition. So what we needed to do is rejig uh, how we look at definitions. Now, you can't do that with formal linguistics. Formal linguistics is simply based on this string of letters. Uh, functional linguistics is based on the meanings of the words. And so we're able to then take meaning as the main element of a word, and then we can connect parts of speech. So the, the lexical piece, which is the word itself, connects to a definition, and then we can connect multiple definitions. Um, and we'll be going through that uh, in a couple of um, days from now. Um, so generation is taking meaning and then pushing it out based on the words and phrases in that particular language. So the concept of translation, which is one of the common questions, hey, if you do NLU, can you do translation? Well, yes, because if you correctly recognize the meaning of the sentences in context, you're then able to accurately generate in the target language um, a response. And we've, we've tested that with nine languages. Um, it looks like it's uh, something that's going to continue as we uh, refine our models. Um, the, the other thing you can see here is an encyclopedic knowledge. So um, if you've broken down sentences into their meaning and then you start to track the context of that, you then finish up with uh, information that is like an encyclopedia. So if you were reading a book and you had certain characters in that book, once you mention that character, you can go to that book because that's your context. and. Um, how all of that uh, works in practice, again, we'll get into it uh, um, in coming, coming days. So, so here's the scientific model. You can see that role and reference grammar is the linguistic framework that we're using. It's, uh, it's functional linguistics. And in the lower left-hand corner, you've got the, uh, the Chomsky model of um, how parsing is, is the key. So syntax grammar is all dominant in the world of linguistics. And we disagree with that uh, on the basis that it doesn't provide the types of information that we need in order to do NLU. Um, but worse, this has now been running for 62 years with some of the world's smartest people trying to produce parsers, breaking down languages. Um, and nobody's ever produced one that works properly. Why is that? Well, because it's just an impossible problem. It's not how human language works, firstly, because it's excluded meaning. Uh, and secondly, uh, it's so highly ambiguous that uh, not even the world's fastest computers can get answers. And if with the, with the current science that we have, if you were to get the system working correctly, it would simply be giving you the wrong answers more quickly. Um, so the, the scientific model has to be uh, simple, but at the same time, it can't be too simple. It can't be simpler than the actual problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, and we'll look at the science behind how you, uh, how you justify this functional model um, again in the future. Now, if we then add meaning to our system, you now connect the syntax to um, this semantic meaning-based representation. That's the, the top of our diagram. And um, that's like looking up the words in a dictionary. There's a bit more to it than that because the words have these other relations that, uh, um, that add complexity to it. But um, um, on the other side of the triangle, we've got discourse pragmatics. So how, how we use uh, in, in our discourse, how we're using this meaning. Uh, because when you're doing um, answering questions or something, the answers to those questions relate to what the question actually is uh, in a very specific way. And we can take advantage of that with machines. Um, so, so anyway, there's our introductory um, slide to, uh, to what the science needs to look like. 
Um, and then a, a comparison between formal and functional linguistics. And uh, um, yes, a word is a sequence of letters. Um, letters are our input symbols. So that's the formal linguistics that uh, Noam Chomsky is renowned for, um, which I will also draw the parallels. That's very much similar to... <clears throat> Sorry, formal linguistics is very much similar to a behaviorist model because you've excluded meaning and behaviorists don't like having meaning in their in their systems. It was considered non-scientific in the 30s and 40s. <clears throat> but obviously the basis of science overcomes that objection. And then functional linguistics uh, is, is based on this concept of, hey, there's... Uh, um, words in a language that refer to something so you know whether it's an action or a, a specific object in the world um, somehow or other we're manipulating these arbitrary signs to the things that they're um, signifying um, so the history of ai i think is well shown in this diagram we started with uh, 1956 cognitive science and ai were uh, both Formed in, in that particular year. Interestingly, September 11 was the day for uh, cognitive science, according to um, according to some. And and it pretty much led with formal linguistics. So Noam Chomsky, um, in terms of linguistics, uh, set his model, which is a formal linguistic model, and that became the rules based um, focus for the next 20 or so years. Um, when rules based systems failed. Um, particularly around 1990, people were able to take the problem that they couldn't solve with rules and convert it into statistics, and that's where computational linguistics came from. Um, so there was a, a great flourish of, of activity trying to do, analyze um, word sequences with statistics. And interestingly, around 2010, 2011, those statistical systems gave way to the more effective systems of um, neural networks, so the, the so-called deep learning system. I don't know why it's called learning because it's not really learning in the way that human learns, but anyway. The deep learning systems, which are simplistic artificial neural networks compared to, to human brains, uh, were then used to, to try and model um, human languages, amongst other things. They seem to be far more effective at uh, uh, some types of uh, visual recognition. Uh, so the statistical systems took over, were replaced by deep learning systems, and all of those systems are, uh, when they work with language, working without meaning. So they're all formal linguistic systems, uh, and that's the reason we haven't progressed. So if we, um, when, when you look at formal linguistics and human language, the challenge is this. Language is infinite, and it's a really big type of infinite. So at certain points in sentences, you get these concepts of junctures, and those junctures allow infinite numbers of information to fit into those slots. We would never get enough information to really solve this. Um, here is a sentence that really illustrates the challenge, uh, the unsolvable challenge for um, formal linguists. Um, certainly those people that are looking for corpus or more data to solve the problem of language. Uh, the man would have seen the woman in her kitchen. Now, we, we get a problem here because um, we can now divide this sentence up into a couple of pieces, but let's just quickly go through what's in the sentence because data is the, the key point when it comes to uh, NLU, language understanding, natural language understanding. So when you see the man would have seen the woman in her kitchen, there's our sentence there. And what we get is some uh, important information. It's a statement, it's future, um, it's a positive statement, and it's a possible statement because it would have, would have seen the woman. Um, and here we've got a high obligation. Um, these types of terms we'll, we'll introduce down the track. Uh, we've got a logical structure. So this is the semantic representation of that. Um, the man sees the woman and that activity takes place in a particular position in her kitchen. We've got definitions here for each of the words. You can see uh, multiple definitions. Uh, and we also have a definition for that particular position. And you could drill down and get more information uh, if you wanted. Um, also here we've got another operator, a thing called a perfect aspect. Uh, and uh, that's something which helps position that particular sentence um, in time.
So there's our introduction to a very simple amount of data um, using NLU. Now let's go to the next slide. And all we've done is we've extended that sentence with a thing called junctures. So the man would have seen to Beth tomorrow to try at the beach today to see the woman in her kitchen. Um, you can see here we still have the man. The man sees the woman. That's unchanged. But there is 13 words between the man and sees. So that's something which these uh, systems based on scanning documents would need to address. Why is it that it's the man that sees the woman rather than one of the other words that's uh, in between? Why isn't it um, Beth seeing the woman, for instance? Or why isn't it the beach seeing the woman? What is it that tells us? And functional linguistics and the concept of predicates and reference, the meaning elements uh, in language, solves that problem for us. Um, so there's, there's the quick introduction to what NLU is. What's our story? So the, the reason I'm here now is I've spent, uh, since the 1980s, um, a lot of time working on how brains work. And what I found was that uh, there's a good model for brains in which, um, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's a human brain or other types of brains, there's sense, sensors which connect to brain material and that brain material connects to other brain material. And if you um, have certain types of brain damage, you can see that damage to areas creates specific deficits. Um, 100 or so years ago, it was observed that um, uh, people can lose the ability to talk, for instance, with damage to Broca's area, um, and damage to Wernicke's area resulted in people being unable to comprehend speech. So there's um, funny deficits that occur with specific damage to parts of the brain. So somehow or other, the brain is localizing that type of information. And equally, there's other types of brain damage. You can uh, lose your ability to recognize color or motion um, on, in terms of just single senses. And then you can, uh, in terms of recognition, other types of brain damage will stop you recognizing um, the whole um, object or parts of the object or vice versa. So there's very specific types of brain damage that we can see. And uh, as a result of that, those types of observations, I came up with this concept of pattern theory. So the fact that within brains, there's pattern atoms that, rep that are the smallest element um, that can recognize um, particular patterns. So by simply story matching and using elements, that all of the types of things that we observe that brains do can be modeled, and that includes language. It's, an, it's a, a very simple concept um, and one that's very powerful when you apply it to things um, that are biologically in, um, biological results of brains. Um, now, one of the things that slowed me down, and you can see I've got a picture of a book there. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just show you it, um, it here. This, this book here by Emma Pavey I found in 2012. I was, I've been working full time uh, on, on building my parser at that stage. Um, based on pattern theory, and I came across this book that had the missing element for me. Believe it or not, I understood extremely well uh, how to recognize anything in a sentence. There's all sorts of ways of breaking a sentence down through trial and error, which is the scientific method after all. Um, I was able to then isolate things that worked properly and things which didn't. And I realized um, I didn't understand how English worked. So how, do, how is it that there's meaning underlying English. And that book, The Structure of Language, was in this Princeton bookshop, in a coffee shop, in fact. Uh, and I grabbed the book, looked at it, thought, oh, that's interesting. It actually explains what clapping is about, what a balloon popping is about, what a snowman melting is about. Why hadn't I heard of this? I'd been studying this for 30-something uh, years. Um, so to cut a long story short, the basis of that book was so earth-shattering to me that I then contacted the author who put me um, in touch with uh, Professor Robert Van Valen, um, who we have a picture of there, uh, which then led to a few more years of work before we finally launched the company I founded, Pad Inc., um, in 2016 in uh, San Francisco. So um, there's our story. And, and the interesting part is that this science is going to revolutionize how machines work. It's not that, um, that complex an idea, but in the same way that epicycles dominated science, the science of astronomy, for more than a thousand years, we've had formal linguistics 
dominating the field of linguistics, um, certainly in terms of the uh, big IT companies um, uh, for the last 60 years. So it's time now to implement functional linguistics to get the results that uh, everybody's demanding these days. I um, just wanted to show you two more slides because this th this is the output of our system and it's showing a couple of um, key points here. So the the meaning of sentences that is determined by the words that you use. It's sort of an obvious point to make, but there's this concept of junctures, which uh, Van Velen explains well in Roland Reference Grammar. So here we've got, can your brother promise Sandy to wash the car? So this juncture takes a particular type of, uh, there's an argument which, which gets passed forward. And you can see here in the, in the bottom here, your brother is the one that does the washing of the car, right? So your brother here causes the car to become clean. There's our semantic representation for it. But that word promise is actually quite complicated. You can see what we've got is uh, the definition. It, what that means is that the brother says something to Sandy which causes your brother to become obligated to do something and the thing that they're obligated to do um, is in this case clean the car. So that's what promise does. But here's another one, persuade. So if your brother persuades Sandy to wash the car, all, we, all we've done is change that one word and all of a sudden, look at this, Sandy is the one that cleans the car. Why? Because here, Sandy wants to do something because of what your brother said to Sandy. So that's persuade versus promise. And language is littered with these types of associations, which a native speaker understands perfectly well. Um, and it's the type of thing which the machines of tomorrow will also understand because this is a very mature science that has been developed for 30 years. I was reading a, a paper from 1993 that just um, blew me away in terms of how uh, particular words worked. And um, we'll, we'll get to that in, uh, in the future as well um, in, one, in one of these, uh, these sessions. But the, the amazing part was somebody had spent five years looking at one particular thing in order to write this paper, which everybody that does NLU will want to know at some stage. And, uh, and here's an example of NLU in action. We start with Beth ate the salmon, so sentences that are propositions. Beth ate the salmon, John ate the cereal, Bill ate the tuna. Thanks for that. The system's saying thanks because it's simply received input. Now it's, here's a question. Beth and Bill. Notice there's no punctuation in the question. It's simply uh, an English question. Beth and Bill. Notice when you say who ate the animals, uh, salmon is an animal, tuna is an animal, so we get Beth and Bill. Beth, John and Bill. Right. Who ate the objects? Beth, John and Bill ate the objects because um, that's what makes sense. Cereal is also an object. And these are the types of things that come from meaning-based systems. Um, so if there's any questions, uh, that's um, who we recommend. That's what we recommend people do to contact us at this stage. Um, uh, certainly there's a, there's a big wait list that started for the API, which is the way of interacting with our system. Well, that's it for today. There's more in the written version, so feel free to check that out to learn more. Next up, I'll be looking at the problem of studying syntax in isolation to meaning for a human language. Please join me again then. I'm John Ball.